In this topic, we're going to look at uh, applying security to wireless traffic. Wireless devices and protocols are heavily used in today's networks and they pose their own unique security challenges. So we're gonna look at how to go about securing traffic over those connections. We'll start with a definition of wireless networks because fundamentally these are networks that just don't rely entirely on physical cabling. Instead, the data is transmitted through low frequency radio waves. Uh, so these signals are able then to cover larger distances and they're also able to pass through physical objects like walls in order to reach their destination. Wireless networking is very prevalent. In fact, just about anywhere you are now, you can pick up a few hotspots via their SSID. Uh, and it's because of all the major advantages. I mean, it's highly portable uh, systems. It saves on the cost of cabling. It uses less physical space. And it has become a very powerful tool for communication, both on internal networks as well as uh, networks that are just simply connecting you to the internet, along with cell phone networks. The problem here is that the propagation of wireless signals will raise unique security concerns because instead of just instead of having to be physically connected to your network, I, I simply have to be within range. And that range can be extended through range boosters, both on the access point side and the client side. So it makes it easier for somebody to try to tap in to a corporate network, say from the parking lot of the organization. So there are a lot of security capabilities that are out there, but they take investigation and research and then, you know, legitimate Im implementation. One of the ways that you can control wireless connectivity is by choosing the right antenna type. There are two main categories for antennas, uh, and they are directional and omnidirectional. Omnidirectional antennas cover a wider area, but don't have a whole lot of gain, whereas, uh, and they're sending things from, you know, in all directions. Directional antennas cover limited area, but with more gain. What's the gain? Well, the gain is just simply a, a reliable connection range. The power of the signal is measured in decibels. So the, the, the higher the gain, the, the stronger the signal. Omnidirectional, you know, ceiling domes are probably the most common type of omnidirectional uh, antenna. This is used to cover rooms in a building with a wireless signal. You also have a rubber duck, which is a small antenna sealed in a rubber jacket. That's ideal for mobility. Uh, they're not very strong. They're often used in walkie-talkies, two-way radios, and other short-range wireless technology. You can see some of these uh, installed in wireless network cards that would plug into a portable computer as well. Directional antennas, uh, multiple types. The, uh, the, the Yagi type is a directional antenna that's used primarily in radio, but also employed in long distance wireless networking to extend the range of hotspots. Parabolic is very precise with a significant amount of gain. It is difficult to establish uh, a, uh, a connection with these with a parabolic because they are so precise. Backfire is a small directional antenna. It looks like a parabolic dish, but it has less gain. And they are used to efficiently target a specific physical area in a, at a distance without overlapping and overextending your coverage. And then cantenna, which is interesting. Uh, it's always funny to me when they add some of these things into the objectives. Cantenna for the longest was the one of those cool websites you could direct people to on the internet, cantenna.com, or I think maybe it was supercantenna.com. It was homemade, a homemade directional antenna that could extend wireless networks. They've perfected it. Essentially, though, what it started out as was a Pringles can, a, a, a metal can that was placed over an existing antenna, and it's homemade. It's meant to discover wireless signals and increase the gain of those signals. When we talk about wireless, we're typically talking about 802.11. It's not uh, guaranteed that that's the case, but the vast majority of the time, that's what we're discussing. 802.11 is the IEEE standard. That's the Institute for Electrical and Electronics Engineers that their standard for wireless communication, okay? Their, their standard for Ethernet is 802.3. Their standard for token ring was 802.5. 802.11 is Wi-Fi, okay? 
Okay, now the reason I say you might not always be talking about that is because some people might be talking about infrared, they might be talking about Bluetooth, NFC, those are all wireless communications, but they are not Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is the 802.11 family of connectivity. They all use radio frequencies. They use the 2.4 gigahertz and the 5 gigahertz frequency bands, and they operate at varying distances as well as operating uh, at various speeds. The original was 802.11. It tapped out at 1 megabit per second. We don't use that anymore. The first legitimate specification, the first one to be called Wi-Fi, was 802.11b. Speeds up to 11 megabits per second at the 2.4 gigahertz frequency range. It has a range of up to 1,000 feet in open spaces, but uh, typically more like 200 to 400 feet in enclosed spaces because you have walls. So walls will uh, lessen the distance. You don't need line of sight, but they will lessen the distance that you can go with that protocol. It is not, back, it is not compatible with 802.11a. 802.11a was introduced and was at the time very fast and secure, but relatively expensive. It had a limited range, but the goal was to increase speeds and to decrease interference. So we increased speeds of up to 54 megabits per second and operate at the 5 gigahertz frequency range, which is why it is not compatible with 802.11b. 802.11g also increased speeds of up to 54 megabits per second, but stayed at the 2.4 gigahertz band. Therefore, it is compatible with 802.11b uh, and can operate at a much faster speed if all the devices are G. It still suffers from interference, which is why we have a release of some of the newer ones, 802.11n, theoretical speed up uh, outputs up to 600 megabits per second. It can operate in either the 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz frequency range. And then 802.11c is the latest one, adding wider channels at the 5 gigahertz band and theoretically increasing speeds up to 1.3 gigabits per second. I say theoretically because a lot of this all depends on distance and interference. So the standard allows for speeds up to that in practical terms, we rarely see speeds that are that fast. Now, the wireless protocol that you choose is going to be dependent on the systems that you have and, and what they support. Okay, and and so you know the latest, the later the protocol, the better performance you're going to get, the less susceptible to interference you're going to be. But it has nothing to do with security. With wireless, we need security protocols, and these are called the wireless cryptographic protocols because they help to encrypt and authenticate. Okay? Now, originally, we had WEP, Wired Equivalent Privacy, which provided 64-bit up to 256-bit encryption using the Rivest cipher or RC4 algorithm. This is deprecated due to the problem we talked about earlier, the fixed size in, uh, initialization vector. It was only 24 bits, and so WEP is extremely vulnerable to an IV attack that is able to predict that IV value. Uh, it has long been since deprecated, and we should never be using WEP. Wi-Fi protected access, or WPA, addressed some of the shortcomings of WEP. It provided for dynamic reassignment of the keys using temporal key integrity protocol to fix the key length issues. So with TKIP, you can remember that the key isn't permanent, all right? So it would automatically change the keys for every packet. And then also use WEP's encryption to provide 128-bit encryption key. It's still vulnerable to an attack in which the contents of small packets can be decrypted, and so it is improved upon with WPA2. WPA2 is well over 10 years old, and so that's the one that we should be using. Uh, ADS CCMP, or this is probably one of the longest acronyms ever, the Counter Mode with Cipher Block Chaining Message Authentication Code Protocol. And yes, I read that. Uh, that is not one that I've ever been able to remember. But that'll add even greater security. It replaces TKIP, provides 128-bit encryption key. It utilizes the advanced encryption standard as opposed to WEP. So WPA2 is going to be the, the, the wireless security protocol that should be, we should be using.
Now, those are protocols that are going to encrypt traffic and make it so that we don't have an open access point. Nobody can just, you know, pop in and connect to the SSID of our network and, and automatically have a connection. They have to authenticate themselves, and that, that process is encrypted. The authentication protocols that get used are listed here. You have EAP, Extensible Authentication Protocol, which is technically a framework that allow the client and server to negotiate the level of authentication they're going to use. And there's a number of different plugins that are available. EAP itself does not specify an authentication method that's going to be used. Some of the most common are EAP TLS, in which the client uses a uh, client-side certificate to authenticate. EAP with tunneled transport layer security uh, is also a client-side certificate, but in this case, it, it's mandated, or I'm sorry, it's not mandated. Uh, it is mandated with EAP TLS. Lightweight EAP is Cisco's proprietary EAP installation. EAP with flexible authentication via secure tunneling or EAP fast is meant to be a replacement of the lightweight EAP. So both of those latter two are Cisco only uh, protocols. What we often see in wireless networks is the use of 802.1x. 802.1x is a standard technically for encapsulating EAP communications over a LAN, but it's been adapted to work with wireless LANs and it provides port-based authentication. So essentially it allows the wireless access point to forward authentication request to a central system. Okay, and that forwarding is done using the RADIUS protocol that we see down below. So the access points, instead of authenticating themselves, can forward that traffic to a central server, which is functioning as a RADIUS server. And then that server can utilize directory databases of user accounts and or certificates to authenticate and then authorize users to make a connection. PEAP or protected EAP is an open standard that was developed by Microsoft, Cisco, and RSA security. Uh, it's not technically an EAP method, but it encapsulates EAP communications using an SSL tunnel. Uh, so it's similar to EAP TTLS, but supports fewer authentication protocols. A PEAP TLS is typically used to secure the initial connection process. Now, one of the primary problems with uh, wireless networks are open wireless networks. These are a massive risk when they are accessed. And the reason is because they are very insecure. They are accessible to everybody. It's insecure public Wi-Fi. So when you're on public Wi-Fi and when users are on public Wi-Fi, you should never be uh, utilizing, you know, connections where you're typing in usernames and passwords and this and that. The question, how many people do you think actually do this? I know I do. I don't even think about it sometimes, but it's very insecure. Attackers can compromise those communications very easy, easily. So if you happen to be using open wireless, you should be tunneling through uh, VPNs, you know, provided that they're using secure tunneling protocols, then they will encrypt data. Now, if you're using older protocols like PPTP, one of the original VPN protocols, then it's still not very secure. But if you're using strong protocols like IPsec, then it, uh, it would be considered secure. So uh, VPNs, anonymous browsers, uh, those are very good methods of securing traffic when you are connected to an open wireless network. Let's talk about some of the authentication methods because when you configure WPA or WPA2, you have the option of choosing between three methods of client authentication. WPA2 personal, which is also called pre-shared key, is going to rely on a pre-shared key generated from a passphrase. The passphrase is not the actual key, but for all intents and purposes it is because all clients are using the passphrase and it's how they get access to the key. If the attacker can guess the passphrase, then the attacker is able to gain unauthorized access to the network. So the more complex the passphrase, the more secure this process is. This is largely used in uh, small to medium-sized businesses where I don't want to generate, I don't want to uh, utilize certificates to secure this, but I do want to have uh, a certain level of security. WPA2 Enterprise will require the client to authenticate using 802.1x with the RADIUS server. It helps mitigate against guessing and brute force cracking of PSKs. It's ideal for larger corporate networks. 
In this case, the clients would typically have a certificate that would be assigned to them, and that certificate would be used to authenticate. The authentication is then forwarded to a RADIUS server. Now, earlier we mentioned Wi-Fi protected setup, WPS, which simplifies the client authentication process, but it works by enabling the client to enter a PIN associated with an access point. You can also have just physical access to the access point and press a button to connect with the client and authenticate. Uh, the PIN method is vulnerable. It should really never be uh, used. And in fact, in most cases, we should just be disabling the Wi-Fi protected setup. There are other methods for securing wireless access points that we should be aware of. MAC filtering is one of them. When you do MAC filtering, you can blacklist or whitelist the devices with certain MAC addresses. So you can say these devices are allowed, these devices are disallowed. So that can help to prevent unwanted devices from authenticating with the network, but it's not a sufficient security method because the MAC addresses can easily be spoofed. So you can use it in conjunction with a security protocol if you want, but you, you, know, you don't need to or you shouldn't use this by itself. Another method that's very commonly done is just disabling the broadcast of your service set identifier. The SSID is how the access point and the wireless network as a whole is identified. And so if I turn off the broadcast, clients will just see it as an unnamed or unknown network and it doesn't allow them to automatically connect. They have to type in the SSID manually. This again is one step along the way, but is not sufficient alone because scanners can reveal those wireless networks that are trying to hide in this way. Uh, signal configuration, we can adjust the signal strength to uh, contain the range of the network. That helps to prevent war driving attacks. We're trying to reduce the signal range. We can also use directional antennas and, and not have a lot of overlap. Uh, you can also utilize different bands. So 5 gigahertz has more bandwidth, but a smaller range. 2.4 gigahertz band has a larger range. There's also a decision between the APs that are used. Uh, thin APs, uh, are, an access point is considered thin if it offloads some of the tasks to another device. A, a fat access point util takes on most of those tasks themselves. Thin APs are useful when we're using centralized authentication. Fat APs are going to reduce complexity because they can configure most of the access point it, itself. Uh, another method of security is what's called a captive portal. This is a technique where a client's connecting to a wireless network and they have to go to a web page. We've all seen this at a you know, hotel, at a uh, airport, a, a coffee shops. Anytime when we're using public Wi-Fi, we typically use this, but a lot of corporations are going this way as well. It's intercepting the client packet until the client completes the portal steps, which usually is just a checkbox saying, I've read and agree the acceptable use policy, and then I connect. We can also authenticate people through login credentials. So I can require that you have a user account and password in, say, Active Directory in order for you to be able to connect to the wireless network. In a general sense, a site survey is just a collection of information about a site uh, for the purpose of constructing something in the best possible way. But here it's in the context of wireless communications and wireless networks will typically go through a wireless site survey phase in order to determine how to design the network in aspect to the hardware location. So it ensures that networks and users have quality coverage and bandwidth and it also helps to ensure that the network is conforming to security practices. Uh, so it, these tools utilize radio frequency signals to model the proposed wireless environments, and they should definitely be used to ensure that we have an adequate signal and that our signal is not going too far, and therefore we're kept secure. So let's summarize some of the guidelines for securing wireless traffic. The first is to choose an antenna that best suits your infra infrastructure needs, omnidirectional or directional. Uh, to select the correct protocol that meets the bandwidth and signal range needs and, and matches the hardware that you have in your systems. Uh, we should always be configuring Wi-Fi networks with WPA2 encryption. We can consider the different authentication protocols. It's very important to use an, a VPN when you're connecting to open Wi-Fi networks. And corporate networks should really use the centralized authentication methods of WPA2. 
Uh, we should avoid using the pin feature of WPS, and I say avoid using it altogether. We don't want to rely solely on Mac filtering or disabling SSID broadcast because those are easily uh, overcome by an attacker. We want to choose the appropriate frequency band. All the later versions, uh, N and AC, allow you to choose the frequency band that you want to use. We can also consider using thin APs because thin APs allow us to mo have more centralized control. I didn't say this, but in a network where we have multiple access points, that centralized control is going to be beneficial. Uh, a captive portal can be implemented in order to require login credentials, and we ought to be conducting site surveys to make sure that we have implemented a wireless network that is going to meet our needs and provide security. So in this chapter, we looked at identifying a lot of different network components that play a role in security, uh, securing us against threats and vulnerabilities. We've applied, uh, talked about security technologies and network design elements, and then also various networking protocols and services and how to go about securing those along with wireless communications. This is all extremely important because a secure network is vital to the overall security of business operations in many organizations.